Uh, I'm a medical researcher, and for the last three or four years, I've uh, hilariously become the go-to person for the media in terms of complementary and natural therapies. And I say hilarious because I was literally a member of the Skeptic Society, uh, until, uh, and still am, of course, I think skeptical is a good position to hold, uh, until I was asked to write a regular newsletter on natural remedies that worked, which I wasn't keen to do at all. Uh, in fact, I think I would rather have written a regular column in Cosmo magazine on handbags. Uh, but anyway, uh, after three or four years of looking into the subjects, I've and reading as many papers as I can, I've concluded that uh, not all uh, complementary natural therapies are useless, it's just most of them. But hidden in there, there are some really, really useful ones. And they get hidden, what I say, in a sea of nonsense. So the, uh, I have a book at the moment about complementary therapies for cancer. It's a very emotive subject. Uh, cancer is fascinating. Uh, out of the billions of cells in our body, just one cell goes haywire and replicates uncontrollably. And that's, uh, that's cancer. And it can, it's going to kill one in eight of us. And it causes harm by just growing locally. Uh, and also it can uh, spread off, metastasize, and grow elsewhere in the body. And also just general effects of having a cancer grown. And uh, the good news, though, is that with conventional treatments, uh, well over half of cancers can be cured now. And that's increasing, and that's increasing with, uh, with better medical research. Uh, now, no complementary natural therapies are going to cure a cancer, but a lot of them can help reduce symptoms and increase quality of life. So we're not talking about cures, we're just talking about helping people. Now, there are thousands of complementary therapies, uh, but they've broken down into five different groups. So the first group, um, the first group is totally different medical systems, ways of thinking about medicine, different to our Western way of thinking about things. So things like Chinese herbal medicine, acupuncture, Indian Ayurvedic medicine, homeopathy, things like that. So things that make no sense at all to a Western scientific background. The second group would be manipulative therapies where something is done to the body or often inserted somewhere into the body. And the third, such as chiropractic or uh, colonic irrigation. The third group would be mind-body therapies, harnessing the power of the mind and the placebo effect uh, particularly. So that would be things like, uh, like, like yoga, like hypnosis, like art therapy and music therapy and even aromatherapy where you're relaxing people and helping uh, health by, uh, by, help, by harnessing the power of the mind, as I say. The fourth group you'll be most familiar with, which is biological therapies, where you may take a supplement or a vitamin or a mineral or a herbal product or a special diet. And the final group is where energies are used, or in some cases pretend energies are supposed to be used to, cure you, to help you. So that's five different types of complementary therapies. I'm certainly not going to list all of them. Now, for people with cancer, around half will use complementary therapies. And, um, and the other half, uh, most of those people will have a good look at them as well. So just about everyone will use them or will think about using them. And it makes perfect sense to me, of course. Uh, I know I certainly would. A lot of patients, uh, people want to leave no stone unturned in their quest for health uh, in, in a particularly bad time. So it makes sense to me. And of those that use complementary therapies, a quarter will use at least seven. And again, that, that makes perfect sense to me. Some people want to do whatever they can to try and remain healthy. And so the use is increasing. And so then it comes down to how do you know which ones work and which ones don't? How do you know if a treatment works or not? So, I mean, this is one of the oldest questions in philosophy, really. How do you know if something is true? Uh, when it comes to science, uh, these questions are answered by the scientific method, which I'm sure everyone is familiar with. You do an experiment. You, uh, you see what the results are, and then uh, you, you see if that's true, and that give, generates ideas for further research. Very, very simple, but very, very powerful. If you look at a graph of life expectancy over the last five, 10,000 years, it's been flat at 30 until just a couple of hundred years ago. Uh, I mean, now, uh, people born today are probably going to live to around 100, so I think that's fascinating. Of course, the reason behind that is science and technology, uh, and the scientific method is a huge part of that. Um, some people would say this occurred when the churches stopped killing scientists, but, uh, but not, not me. <laughs> and so the question is, how do you know if a treatment works? Now, if you took, say, let's use the example of echinacea for a common cold. 
If you had a cold and you take echinacea, your cold goes away, you will think that the echinacea helped. That's very sensible. Nothing will ever change your opinion on that. But there are three main reasons why you may think a treatment works when it doesn't. And this is what fools people. Uh, the first one I've already alluded to is the placebo effect. So when you take a treatment, there's an expectation that you're going to get better, and people often do. The placebo effect is very powerful. Up to 40% improvements are commonly seen in clinical trials. And in some conditions, uh, up to 90% of people will respond favorably to a placebo. So certainly placebos are well, well understood. Uh, not, well, it's, uh, it's reasonably well understood, and certainly uh, we see it all the time in clinical research. Uh, the other reasons you may not have thought about as much, uh, the second one is what we call the natural history of a condition. So, of course, that cold is going to get better on its own, almost certainly, unless it develops into a pneumonia. And the problem is, though, that people will think it's the treatment that's helped. They won't uh, have thought about it just getting better on their own, and that's the way people think about things. Same for other conditions. An ear infection will generally get better over a few weeks. Chronic fatigue syndrome will generally get better over a couple of years. But if you have a treatment around the time where you notice a big improvement in your health, you'll think that the treatment works. And the third reason, which is slightly more ill-defined, is additional measures we do when we're ill. So if you've got cold, you're probably going to watch uh, daytime TV, you're going to have time off work, you're going to have some chicken soup, some lentip, some brandy, uh, lots of sleep. Whatever you do in addition, those things may or may not be helping as well. Uh, but again, you're going to put any, you're going to attribute any positives to the echinacea. So there's additional measures. Now, the incredible power of the randomized control trial, which is the gold standard of medical research, uh, it comes about because it effectively eliminates all three of those additional fact of, of those confounding factors. Okay, uh, so in a, in a randomized control trial, you have two groups of people, half get the treatment, half don't. They're randomly allocated to those groups, ideally to be double blind, so the person taking the treatment and the person uh, assessing the treatment don't know who's taking what, and you get some very, very powerful results. So in medical research, we have, a bit like in law where you have uh, different levels of, 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 of proof, it's the same in medical research. And the top five uh, levels, number five, would be what an expert says, so what a, a famous professor says about a treatment. Number four would be what an expert body says about a treatment, say the, the Cancer Society. Number three would be certain types of non-gold standard medical research. Number two would be just a small randomized controlled trial. Uh, and number one is a large controlled trial or a meta-analysis where we put them together. So that's the incredible power of a randomized controlled trial.